Hello, everyone. Um, we'll give it a couple more minutes for everyone to come in and settle in. Um, Dr. Coyne is here with us live, so say hi, Dr. Coyne. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay, we see a couple more people coming in. Maybe we'll give it another minute or so. Um, still pretty early, so we have less of time for everyone to just settle in. How are you doing today, Dr. Coyne? I'm doing pretty fine. I was in clinic this morning um, and then got to come home and get ready for this and tomorrow's another day. So it's been great. It was a beautiful day in Philadelphia too. That's awesome. I'm very glad to have you here today. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks again for having us. No worries. Always excited to collaborate with um, ASOS. So it looks like we have a couple more people coming in. So yeah, let's give it another minute. Um, it's only four o'clock, so everyone's jumping in um, on the dot. So while we're waiting for um, you know, more attendees to uh, filter in, just a quick housekeeping note before everything um, gets started. Um, we will be doing a live Q&A session at the end of the, um, the lecture. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions box in your GoToWebinar panel. We'll answer the questions at the very end of Dr. Coyne's presentation. So, um, you know, if you have anything preliminary or anything comes up during um, her lecture, please feel free to just type it and we'll address it at the very end. Hey, Andy, nice to see you here. Glad you could join us. We have our colleague from Australia joining us today and he just said hello to oh, us. Oh, welcome. Right. Looks like we have more people coming in. Um, you know, while we have uh, more attendees coming into the window, I'll do a quick introduction. So with that in mind, um, just want to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Larni Cayetano, and I'm the Marketing Manager here at Luminous Vision. A quick intro um, to Luminous. Luminous is the proud inventor of Intense Pulse Light, SLT, and the first argon photocoagulator. We are renowned for technological breakthroughs in atomic light-based devices with a long history of gold standards. With over 50 years of presence in the eye care industry, Luminous Vision has focused on providing eye care providers with innovative therapies to preserve and improve the sights of patients worldwide. In collaboration with the American Society of Optometric Surgeons, we are bringing you a webinar series focused on interior segment lasers and IPL technology. Joining us today is Dr. Alyssa Coyne. She received her Doctor of Optometry degree from the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salis University and completed a primary care ocular disease residency at the Eye Institute in Philadelphia. She's obtaining her master's degree in pharmacology and toxicology from uh, Michigan State University. Dr. Coyne is currently on faculty at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where she lectures in ocular pharmacology, minor surgical procedures, and ophthalmic lasers. She will kick off a collaborative webinar series with a talk on laser physics and tissue interaction. Now, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Dr. Coyne. Dr. Coyne, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us from whichever time zone that you might be in. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background as part of an introduction to a different type of laser um, series that's going to happen. We're going to have a discussion about SLT and then PI in a couple of weeks. And then Dr. Rich Castillo is going to finish up kind of our, our series that's happening. So today I'm going to provide more some of the background uh, to have that information where we can talk more so about the procedures on our next couple of lectures. So when we talk about laser, a lot of different um, type of jobs in a different type of communities end up using different lasers. And you can see that a lot of this ends up being based obviously on the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we talk about our specific lasers that's used in ophthalmic care, we're gonna concentrate on our ultraviolet spectrum, the visible portion of our electromagnetic spectrum, and again, the near infrared. When we talk about laser, it's an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And really the take home from this, that stimulated emission, this is how we end up changing a photon or regular light into laser light to do intended damage. And again, it's comparing that stimulated emission as compared to spontaneous emission. So when we talk about different type of laser properties, this is gonna be a little bit different compared to typical light and or to spontaneous emission. And that is because it's gonna be monochromatic, meaning that the light or the photons that end up leaving the laser are all gonna be the same energy and the same wavelength. Additionally, this decreases your chromatic aberration. They're also gonna be highly coherent in that all of the wavelengths that leave the laser are gonna be in phase. So here I have a picture of a sine or a cosine wave, and essentially they're gonna be matched they're going to be identical. Another uh, portion of that is that it's going to be highly directional or highly collimated. I'm going to talk about a couple of examples in the next few slides. This highly uh, collimated detail ends up meaning that there's minimal divergence, and that is why we can end up harnessing the energy that ends up corresponding to those photons and really do damage to the tissue uh, that we want. So the light emitted that comes from a laser ends up being non-ionized electromagnetic radiation. So I really like this graphic in that it kind of shows you that the light that ends up coming from an incandescent light bulb, you can see all the different wavelengths, they're not in phase, they're not gonna be the same wavelength, so they're not monochromatic. We end up having all of this energy that's divergent and we can't really do anything with it. If you then move on to a specific light bulb, I always kind of talk about this like a heat bulb so that you would find in old bathrooms. So you can see that the wavelengths that are emitted from this bulb end up being the same wavelength. So we all have that red, we all see the red wavelength. However, you can also appreciate the fact that they're not in phase. So you're not gonna have as much energy associated with it. But we know that you have more as compared to our typical incandescent light because you can feel the heat. We know that this can end up warming up the bathroom. And the bottom portion ends up showing you a laser which needs to be built. And you can appreciate that emitted wavelengths or those emitted photons end up being or matching all of the properties that I had previously discussed in that they're in phase, they're going to be highly collimated, and that they're going to be the same wavelength. So this kind of leads me into, let's talk a little bit about the fact that when we talk about laser light or those photons that are emitted, that they're highly directional or that they're collimated. So this is a perfect example of when we talk about laser strikes. And you can see in this graphic from laserpointersafety.com and that it took a graphic from the FAA that the number of reported laser strikes over time from about 2004 until July of 2020, you know, it ended up moving up and being reported exponentially, especially between 2014 and 2015. Now there has been a decrease as far as from July 2020 as compared to 2019. Is that just because people are becoming more aware and safer about it? Is it because of COVID and there's not as many flights? You know, there are so many different factors that can really affect that reporting. But I thought it was interesting if you end up looking kind of halfway down on this graphic, um, in 2020, there have been 14 and a half laser incidents reported each night in the United States on average. Now, is that all just people kind of fooling around with lasers and kind of pointing them into the sky. It may not necessarily be that they're aiming for aircrafts per se, but another thing to think about 
um, is how it ends up affecting the pilots. So this ends up being a photo actually from the UK, and you can see that this ends up being a green laser. Now in the United States, green lasers um, are only supposed to be sold up to five milliwatts, and that would make it a class three R laser. Now that being said, if someone is in possession of a green laser that is beyond five milliwatts, um, it's not illegal. And it's also not illegal for online vendors and or even in-person vendors to sell green lasers that have higher milliwatt power. And the reason for that is when we talk about five milliwatts, it's really just for pointing purposes. But if they sell this from a non-pointing purpose or a reason, that is like a way that they can skirt the recommendation or what's supposed to be legal. So some of these non-pointing purposes might include things like burning or even balloon popping. So it's kind of interesting how they get around it, but those individuals that are in possession of these grain lasers, um, it's, it's not illegal in, unless it's in certain jurisdictions. Now, when you end up looking at this photo, you can see that the laser light ends up being definitely dispersed and diffuse. And the reason is over time or over um, space, it ends up losing some of that ability for it to stay kind of directional. And this is also the reason why there aren't any reported long-term or permanent side effects or ocular damage associated with these laser strikes. Most times it's reported that the pilots might end up having headaches or that they might be dazzled, but because it's not necessarily focused onto the retina and because it ends up not being such a concentrated beam, this is why we don't have permanent damage. Now, here's another great example. So people don't really want to put on their Christmas lights. They uh, end up using this star shower that you can find almost anywhere. And a lot of times they end up being sold out around Christmas time. These end up utilizing laser lights. Now with this, another great example is that they're highly collimated, is that there ends up being reports of these that end up tipping over and they end up interrupting, you know, here's one of a Coast Guard plane. Another one ended up being a Boeing 737. And it's even at 13,000 feet. So it's just a great example to show you how powerful these lasers can end up being because unless there's something to absorb that light, they kind of continue on, um, but they do become more divergent over time. So when we talk about different type of principles of laser light, we're going to talk about energy levels. Now, when photons and atoms interact, they can interact in three different ways. The atom can either absorb energy or the photon or you can have spontaneous emission, or you can have stimulated emission. And we're gonna kind of combine all three. When we talk about those energy levels, it's really the amount of total energy that you need to move an electron that's found within the outer portion of the atom to a higher level. We're also gonna discuss population inversion. And this is where you excite a vast majority of the electrons kind of in the system to a higher state, and then they wanna move back down to their um, ground state. And the final aspect of this is this stimulated emission that I keep going back to. And this is where you end up adding in an external source. This can be an energy source um, that it ends up coming from a plug into the wall. It can be a light that it uses a photon that it puts it into the system. And by putting this into the system, you end up getting more bang for your buck, that you end up getting more wavelengths at the same, um, that end up producing that coherent uh, light. So when we talk about the different energy levels, you know, when we talk about an atom, you're gonna have a positively charged nucleus, you're gonna have electrons that surround it on the outside. And what you can do is you can move these electrons into different orbits or that you can end up stimulating them into higher levels or states. So when we talk about it, um, here you put energy into the system. Oop. We ended up exciting one single electron, but that electron always want to, wants to return to the ground state. So it ends up hitting this metastable state or this lower energy state. And as it returns to the ground state, it ends up emitting spontaneous emission. This is incoherent light. We can't really do anything with it. But if you kind of alter the system a little bit or the environment, what you can do is that you can put more energy into the system. And remember I said that these atoms can end up absorbing that energy. So when you end up stimulating more of the electrons of the entire system, this right here, it's called pumping the system. You have this differential where now you have more electrons in an excited state or in a higher state as compared to a ground state. 
Again, like I said before, they want to move back down to their ground state, but they're going to hit this metastable state. Now, the way that this ends up being a little bit different for us to get stimulated emission is that we have this incident photon. So a photon is put into our system from this external source. Again, that can be a light source. When you end up crossing over as those electrons are moving back down to the ground state and it crosses over with that incident photon, you now also produce another photon that ends up being the same wavelength and it's in phase. So now what we've garnered is the fact that we have monochromatic light and it's coherent. So we can harness this energy and we can do damage with it. This is just another graphic to show you. So here in the blue light, you can see on the top left-hand side, we've already excited that atom or more specifically the electrons. So we've already pumped that system. Now, if you have a lot of electrons and you put more energy, you can end up creating that population inversion. We have that incident photon that comes from our external source. And as we have emission, meaning that the uh, electron is moving back down to the ground state, it crosses over with our original photon and now we end up getting again two photons kind of for the price of one but think about this when you're creating a laser that we're doing this over and over and that there's many different atoms and that we're creating many photons that end up creating that same wavelength and then end up creating that emitted photon or that emitted specific laser light. When we talk about creating a laser, there's different laser components. So we have different mediums. There's solid, liquid, gas, and there can also be semiconductor. I'm going to concentrate mostly on a solid and a gas today. So a solid state laser would be our ND YAG laser. A gas laser would be an argon laser. You need a pump source. This can either be electrical in nature or optical in nature. And you also need a resonator, which is also known as a resonance cavity. So what's gonna happen is you have your medium and the photons pass back and forth between that medium. And what they're going to do is they're going to bounce off the two reflective mirrors, which would be one and four um, in this graphic. And every time you're just creating more of those photons that are now going to be um, in phase, and they're obviously gonna be the same wavelength. Now what happens is you're gonna end up having an output coupler that's just a small opening that once it's in line, you end up getting emission of that laser light. So when we talk about the medium for an ND YAG laser, this ends up being kind of a neodymium aspect or a neodymium solid state, and then it's impregnated with um, a yttrium and then also aluminum to kind of make up that portion of our ND YAG. Different modes of operation exist for different type of lasers, with the most popular being a continuous wave laser and or a pulse-based laser. So when we talk about a continuous wave, this is something where I always tell our students, you can kind of step on the pedal and until you take your foot off, it can continue to fire. Now there are different ways that you can alter that because you can put in the amount of time that you wanna fire for each shot. But continuous wave ends up being that it's not necessarily one short pulse um, and there's a specific timing that goes along with it. We measure our output in watts and our examples of continuous wave lasers would be an argon laser, which we know is gas, or a frequency doubled ND YAG. I'm going to talk more about frequency doubled ND YAG later in the uh, lecture, but with this, it's almost analogous to an argon, except um, the way that we end up creating that wavelength and the way that we go about utilizing it is a little bit different as compared to that gas laser. When you talk about pulse lasers, uh, a great example of this would be Q-switched lasers. So this is when you fire, it's always gonna be for the same amount of time. The energy output with this is gonna be measured in millijoules and examples of this would be an ND YAG laser, which fires for approximately four nanoseconds or an eczema laser, which is approximately 10 to 12 nanoseconds. So when we talk about continuous wave, What's going to happen is that this laser beam or our laser light is continuously emitted and you need to have a pump that corresponds with that and a lot of times this ends up being an electrical current. That being said, it can also require more power that it's not necessarily that you can just take your plug and plug it right into your wall. And the biggest thing with these continuous wave lasers is that you're going to have a thermal effect. So these are going to be photothermal in nature, so they're going to burn tissue. 
When we talk about Q-switched lasers, which is a type of pulsed laser, this is going to have a, pul a brief pulse of that laser beamer of the laser light. So like I said, with a Q-switched ND YAG, it fires for approximately four nanoseconds. We cannot change how quickly that an ND YAG laser is going to fire. That is not even an option that when you end up turning a laser on and you end up firing it, it is going to be approximately four nanoseconds every single time. The way that you end up having this Q switch is that there's really a shutter that's placed in the laser cavity. So the Typically the shutter is closed and you have your energy building where the photons are kind of hitting against that. When you end up firing, the shutter opens and then closes very quickly. Again, approximately that four nanoseconds. And what's gonna happen is that you get this brief pulse of large energy or large amount of energy that ends up being released over a very brief period of time. So this is kind of when we talk about our power density equation where it ends up being, um, power over time when we're looking at that. Now, when you have a very long wavelength, we know that there's not a lot of energy with that as compared to a shorter wavelength. So when we discuss ND YAG lasers, the wavelength associated with an ND YAG is 1064. So that ends up being quite a long wavelength, not a lot of energy associated with it. We end up utilizing that Q switch or that shutter and that very short brief pulse of nanoseconds, 10 to the minus nine, to get a very brief burst of a lot of energy all at once to kind of then start our laser process. What happens with this is by having that short amount of energy, we end up creating a plasma. And with a plasma, we're essentially stripping um, we're stripping electrons off molecules, and inside the eye, this ends up being an aqueous, it ends up being in fluid. So we have more tightly packed molecules that it's easy to kind of strip those electrons off to really create that plasma. And this ends up working by something that's called photo disruption. Photo disruption is kind of a micro explosion. It's almost like dropping a small grenade and having that outward explosion that ends up doing the damage. So when we talk about laser absorption, tissue transparency is gonna be very important, but this is not just is the cornea clear, it's also is the tissue transparent specifically for that wavelength. So different wavelengths end up being either absorbed or transmitted um, by different structures. And this is why we obviously use different lasers for different type of ocular procedures. So we wouldn't end up utilizing an eczema laser to do a PI. And the reason for that is we know that the cornea is gonna end up absorbing that shorter wavelength length for an eczema laser. You know, when we end up utilizing a photothermal laser, whether it's an argon laser or a frequency doubled ND YAG, we can end up utilizing that on the iris or we can end up utilizing that for the retina. Can it end up harming the cornea? You have to try. Um, you really have to have, you know, a lack of focus that's there. But again, that is going to be transmitted through the clear cornea to kind of where we're focused on our specific tissue. So you can see that shorter wavelengths end up being absorbed um, more anteriorly and longer wavelengths end up passing through and or being transmitted more posteriorly. So when we talk about different damage mechanisms that are here, we're gonna concentrate on photochemical, photothermal, and photo disruption. So photochemical uh, damage is going to be by ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet light is obviously outside the visible spectrum. So when we talk about an eczema laser, its wavelength is 193 nanometers. Again, this is gonna be absorbed by the anterior segment more of the cornea. When we talk about photothermal, this is going to utilize more of that visible light and sometimes infrared. And when we discuss photo disruption, this is gonna be within our infrared wavelength. So this is gonna be beyond 700 nanometers. This is gonna be, again, closer to that 1064 that I talked about with the ND YAG. Again, these are just our examples of our most popular ophthalmic lasers that we end up utilizing. Um, and again, you can see our photothermal, we have argon listed here and frequency doubled ND YAG. Now I have two different wavelengths listed associated with argon, 488 nanometers or 514 nanometers. Now a true argon laser is blue-green, but we will filter out that blue in order to protect sometimes the doctors and even the patients where it ends up taking on more of a green hint to it. By removing or filtering out the blue wavelength, it actually increases um, the wavelength of an argon laser up to 514 nanometers. 
Again, the reason that that's performed is trying to protect the macula, more specifically the fovea, because of the yellow xanthophils that are located there. So let's talk a little bit about photothermal damage. When you think about photothermal, you're thinking it burns, and that's really what we're doing, is that we're causing or creating photocoagulation. And the way that we do that is we're heating proteins to the, to the point that we're denaturing them. These uh, typically work, especially in the posterior segment, usually from your inner nuclear layer to your outer retina, deeper to the RPE, even the choriocapillaris. But the biggest thing with this is that this is going to be pigment dependent. You need pigment there to absorb this laser wavelength. So the more pigment that you have, the more easily that it's going to be absorbed. With this, there is conversion to heat. Now, when we think about treating the retina from a retinal specialist standpoint, you know, you end up seeing that there's a retinal tear and you're prepping the patient to say, you need to see the retinal specialist, they're gonna perform laser, you might get the question of, is it going to hurt? Am I gonna notice it? Well, theoretically, the answer to that is, no, they shouldn't feel it, and that is because you don't have any sensory nerves located in the retina. However, because you have this conversion to heat, there's a heat production that's there, and we know that deeper to that, you know, in the choroid and in the sclera, they end up having sensory nerves. So your patient can interpret that heat, I'm gonna say as awareness, but they might come back and say, oh, I, it was definitely painful. Other things that they're going to notice is that there's flashes of light, that it's very bright. Most times the feedback that I end up getting from patients who end up having either barrier laser or PRP is that it feels like they were either like punched in the back of the eye and or that they have a pretty bad headache because of it. And again, it has to do more so with that emitted heat corresponding to that photocoagulation. And again, I'm going to point out, it's very important that when we talk about photothermal, this is pigment dependent. So in individual that has more pigment, you probably need less power associated with it because especially if there's a lot of brown pigment with the iris, you don't need as much energy. Where if someone ends up having a blue iris and you want to utilize a photothermal laser either to pretreat and or create a peripheral iridotomy, you're going to actually need more power to create that because there's not as much pigment to absorb that wavelength. Here are the different options that you can do from an anterior and posterior segment utilizing those photothermal lasers. So ALT, we always know that this works a little bit better, especially when they have pigment in their posterior trabecular meshwork. An argon peripheral iridotomy or a photothermal peripheral iridotomy um, isn't the most popularly performed anymore, but it is a possibility. You can also pretreat and stretch the um, iris a little bit before switching over to an ND YAG laser to kind of blow through or finish that up. You can also cause cauterization of the punctum, so you can do this with punctal occlusion, and laser iridoplasty or gonioplasty that might be utilized, especially if someone has plateau iris configuration or plateau iris syndrome. Now, that being said, I remember during my residency, I ended up discovering a patient who had plateau iris. They had a PI. There really wasn't a change of the configuration, especially with OCT. And I talked to our anterior segment specialist, and I said, oh, I think the next step that we should do is laser iridoplasty. And the response was, Alyssa, nobody does that. And I thought, okay, I mean, I guess I'm a little bit dated. We'll continue on pharmaceutical treatment. And once I really started to get into lasers, I realized that a lot of times, our anterior segment specialists aren't necessarily going to have a photothermal laser, right? It's more so of our retinal specialists that are going to end up having that photothermal laser because of the treatment associated with it. And then most popularly from a posterior segment standpoint, barrier laser where we're really creating a moat and creating a scar around that retinal break and then panretinal photocoagulation or PRP in order to treat um, most often diabetic retinopathy, but you know that that can be any type of proliferative disease. So when we talk about photothermal from an argon standpoint, we know that this is going to be a gas. When we talk about a frequency doubled ND YAG, that is going to be from a solid state laser. Again, you can end up seeing this. So this is actually our laser that we have in Laser Lab. You can see the green light coming from it. We filtered out the blue. So we're at that 514 nanometer wavelength. On this bottom photo, you can see a Heaney beam. So this is a helium neon, another type of laser, that's acting as a guiding beam. Now, despite the fact that you can appreciate and or view that um, 
you can see the photothermal laser that's there. Utilizing this aiming beam really helps for spot size and focusing on the tissue. So you can change this from about a 50 micron spot size. I typically give the example that 50 microns is the width of strand of hair. That being said, the width of a strand of hair can um, differ vastly, but again, usually that's kind of a good idea or a good example to appreciate how small that you can make this up to, um, in some instances, that it can be uh, 200 microns or 500 microns that you can make this a very large aiming beam. All right, here's our frequency doubled ND YAG. So now we're taking an ND YAG, which I mentioned was a very long wavelength. It's 1064 um, nanometers. With that, it works by photo disruption. Again, that ends up being a micro explosion. How do we take this photo disruption and then really turn it into a photothermal uh, mechanism of action? And the way that we do that is that we frequency double that wavelength. And the way that we do that is actually inside the laser. You can put a crystal um, in other ways that they use other type of solids, but in this situation that they end up taking a crystal. And by having those two photons with the same frequency, which would be 1064 to start with and then interact with a crystal, we end up generating a new photon that has a new wavelength. So it ends up being half the original wavelength. So in this situation, it's 532 nanometers, which is half of 1064, but it's also twice the frequency. So by putting it in frequency doubling it, we're putting it into our visible spectrum, we're putting it at 532. And 532 nanometers is pretty close to our 514 associated with an argon laser. So they end up being close in our wavelengths. And then I kind of, again, say that they're siblings or that they're sisters, that whatever you can do with an argon laser, you can do with a frequency doubled ND YAG or a 532 photothermal laser. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about SLT just because we have an excellent lecture coming up about SLT in the next couple of weeks, but when we talk about SLT lasers, in order to do SLT, you have to have an SLT laser, and the reason for that is an SLT laser is a Q-switched frequency doubled ND YAG. So what we've done is we, we've taken that 1064 nanometers, we've cut it in half, so now we're at that 532. But you know with SLT, we're not burning tissue, and that is because we're applying this for a sh very short amount of time, and we don't meet what's called the thermal relaxation time of the pigment of the trabecular meshwork. And the way that we do that is by adding in that Q-switch. And remember, when we talk about that Q switch, that means that we're adding in a shutter. So when we talk about a selective laser trabeculoplasty or an SLT laser, we end up creating the shutter that it, we're decreasing the amount of time to about three nanoseconds so that we don't meet the thermal relaxation time to cause a burn in the posterior trabecular meshwork. When we discuss photochemical, again, this is gonna be at a very short wavelength. So when we talk about an eczema laser, it's at about 193 nanometers. You can consider photoablation a photochemical effect or photoradiation, which is better known as photodynamic therapy or PDP, is also a photochemical effect. So when we concentrate on our corneal refractive procedures, that very short wavelength is absorbed by the cornea. And when it's absorbed, when it's absorbed by the cornea, what happens is that we end up breaking molecular bonds, carbon to carbon bonds that are there. This is going to be pigment independent and compare that to when we talk about our photothermal laser that is pigment dependent and compare that to when we end up talking about our ND YAG laser, which is also pigment independent. So we know that there's not gonna be um, pigment on the cornea, that it doesn't have to be there to be absorbed. And essentially what's gonna happen is that these bonds end up being broken and create a plume effect so that these tissues really end up being vaporized and we utilize photoablation essentially as a sculpting tool. Photoradiation in PDT, the laser doesn't do the damage. With that, we end up injecting dye. The laser ends up essentially stimulating the dye and ends up creating free radicals. And those free radicals are then primed within the abnormal tissue or the abnormal blood vessels. And then they kind of break down from the inside as part of that. Sorry about that. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about an eczema laser. So we know an eczema laser is going to be that photoablative effect. Again, we're breaking those carbon to carbon bonds. Now, a lot of patients might end up telling you that they feel as though they can smell something burning. Again, when we're talking about this, there is no photothermal reaction that's happening. And that is really the breaking of the bonds and it requires a lot of energy. Because it requires a lot of energy, we also know that we need a very short wavelength. The terminology eczema just means excited dimer, and most popularly, it means it's a noble gas combined with a halide. And like I said before, this ends up being absorbed by the cornea. Because this laser wavelength is below what is the visible spectrum, you know, at 193 nanometers, again, we end up having these Heaney beams or these guiding beams that we can see which part of the cornea ends up being treated. When we talk about something like LASIK or PRK with the use of an eczema or laser, for every pulse associated with that eczema or laser, it usually removes about 0.25 microns of tissue or of stroma. Our different corneal refractive procedures that utilize the eczema lasers are listed. I did put PTK on here with a little asterisk. I realize that that's not a refractive procedure, but rather it's for a treatment or a therapeutic treatment, um, very analogous to PRK. Here's my favorite. So let's talk about photo disruption. So like I said before, photo disruption is essentially like um, is essentially a micro explosion, and we are going to make that happen inside the eye. The way that we do that is we are firing right from our ND YAG laser. And when you end up delivering that laser light, what happens is that you are creating a plasma. The way that you create a plasma is that you're stripping electrons from the atoms. Again, like I said, you have tightly bound molecules that are found in fluid or aqueous. So again, we don't need a lot of energy to create the plasma formation that happens inside the eye. So once you strip these electrons off, they're going to actually move in an outward motion um, and along with ionization that occurs. So when we talk about plasma, remember that this ends up being our fourth state of matter. Everyone is very good about saying solid, liquid, gas, and then remember we have plasma as our last type or last form um, to correspond with that. Plasmas end up having characteristics of both gases and metals. And as this plasma expands, it essentially creates kind of like a sonic wave. It's made up of a shock wave and an acoustic wave or a sound wave. Now, we don't really use the acoustic wave for anything. We utilize that shock wave. So again, we want to have this micro explosion and the outward movement of the explosion is going to end up ripping tissue, whether that means that we're going to end up helping to create a peripheral iridotomy in the iris and or that we're going to create a YAG opening, especially of the posterior capsule. We are really utilizing that explosion to rip open that tissue. Now, the audible snap that occurs with it, your patient might hear it inside their head. So that's also something that I kind of let them know when I'm sending them for any type of YAG procedure. I'll say, you know, the doctor, or if you're in a state that has laser rights that you're doing this yourself, you might say to the patient, um, you're going to be in the slit lamp, you um, will have a lens on the front surface of the eye, you might hear popping in your ears, and that's completely normal. Kind of prep them beforehand. And like I said before, um, this is pigment independent. We know that there's not going to be pigment on our posterior capsule. Um, and then for treatment of the iris from a PI standpoint, depending on if there's a brown iris or a blue iris, while I say that this is pigment independent, a lot of times a brown iris might be thicker that you may have to increase the amount of energy to help break through. The reason that I have a picture here of lightning is that the perfect example of a plasma formation ends up being thunder and lightning, where lightning ends up being that shock wave, it's what does the damage, and thunder is the acoustic wave associated with it. Um, I always am looking for pictures. I kind of troll the internet a little bit, and I ended up finding this great picture actually on Reddit. So if you see an explosion here, and if you end up seeing the clear outline associated with that, that ends up being your shock wave. That is what's really doing the damage. So if you think about this when you're dropping a grenade, where the grenade lands doesn't do the damage, but rather the outward explosion ends up kind of creating that damage. And that's the same principle that we're thinking about when we're going to focus um, our ND YAG laser. 
So if you want to do a posterior capsulotomy, you do not want the explosion to go off right at or right in that posterior capsule because it's not going to have that forward or backward motion of the explosion to create that tissue damage. What's going to end up taking the brunt of it is actually the lens implant. So what is done is there's actually an offset that can either be built into the laser and or it can be adjustable within the laser. On average, somewhere between 100 to 250 microns is the best um, location of where we want the explosion to go off. So that forward explosion is helping to rip open that opacified posterior capsule. So when we talk about an ND YAG laser, it stands for neodymium yttrium aluminum garnet. I talked a little bit about the fact that um, that neodymium crystal ends up being impregnated, and as the photons are passed through it, that's how our laser light is created um, in a solid state or from a solid state. We know that this utilizes photo disruption and that its wavelength is found within our infrared spectrum, which also makes it invisible. Therefore, we also need to have our Heaney beams or our aiming beams to act as a guide for us about where we are going to focus so that we know the explosion is going to go off slightly behind and create that damage or rip open that capsule and or kind of within the stroma to create the PI. Now, when you look at this, the shape of an ND YAG beam is a, called a cone beam. So I always say it kind of looks like a sideways ice cream cone that's there. Now, the radius of that can also be changed. Now, when we talk about ophthalmic lasers or an ophthalmic ND YAG laser, that is always going to be 16 degrees. And the reason it's going to be 16 degrees is so that it fits through the pupil. Other type of healthcare professionals, podiatrists also use ND YAG lasers. They don't have to have such a small cone beam because they don't have to fit through such a small opening. But you can see that I ended up putting two um, of our Heaney beams that follow the cone beam, and as they come together to a focus, you end up getting one. Now, a popular number is it's usually two. Sometimes you can have four Heaney beams. Sometimes they can be stationary and they just form one. Sometimes they can also be um, in a circle, in a moving circle. You can also defocus a little bit where they can cross each other and that you can form two beams again and kind of bring that back and forth to help with your focus. All the different things that you can do with an ND YAG laser from an anterior segment and posterior segment standpoint um, with YAG PI and posterior capsulotomy being the most common. You can also create an anterior capsulotomy, especially if there's capsular phimosis. Um, this can also be utilized for anterior stromal puncture. Again, not very popular, but it is a possibility. Vitreolysis is becoming more and more popular to kind of break apart those floaters so that patients might notice them a little bit less often. And interestingly enough, I read a couple of case reports about utilizing an ND YAG laser for embolysis, where essentially a patient might have a Holland horse plaque, maybe they have a branch retinal artery occlusion, or they're afraid that they're at risk for a branch retinal artery occlusion, where they end up focusing the ND YAG laser on that embolus, they break it apart. Now, we know that blood vessels end up being just tubes that carry blood. It's not unusual that you can end up getting a hemorrhage, um, whether that ends up being pre-retinal, um, when this ends up being performed. Again, it's not a very performed procedure. It's just that I was trying to be comprehensive and telling you what we can utilize ND YAG lasers for. I'm going to move on to femtosecond lasers. So femtosecond lasers also use photo disruption. Now that being said, um, by having a long wavelength, there's going to be less collateral damage associated with those longer wavelengths, even with an ND YAG laser. But even that change from a femtosecond laser for the amount of seconds that it's fired for, right, which is 10 to the minus 15 as compared to a nanosecond with an ND YAG laser, there is 106 times less collateral damage with a femtosecond laser as compared to an ND YAG laser. So anytime that you need very precision points or very precise um, changes, especially when we're talking about corneal surgery, this ends up being a really good aspect to utilize that because of the minimized collateral damage and we're really only kind of focused on that target tissue. We know different applications include um, 
blade less LASIK or intralace LASIK. Also the new Relic Smile procedure where this ends up helping to create that lenticule or lenticule that is then bluntly dissected. This can also be utilized in laser assisted cataract surgery, channel creations for different type of implants, um, either for a PKP um, or a dated um, intacts that it can be utilized for. And then again, your laser assisted keratoplasty. Just a couple of pictures that go along with it. Uh, in the bottom right, this ends up being an anterior segment surgeon that is bluntly dissecting the, the lenticule um, that ends up being created both a top and bottom portion that ends up being removed. Above that, you can see kind of the grid aspect that's applied for when we're um, creating that capsulorexis, that laser-assisted capsulorexis. And then on the top left-hand side ends up being the creation of kind of those bubble forming or the, I, I utilize the term perforations, it's not the most correct way to kind of explain it, where essentially your stainless steel spatula then lifts and connects the dots to have that um, flap. Your bottom left-hand picture that's here would be that Z-shaped incision um, that can kind of act as a zipper for um, if a patient's receiving a PKP where that button is then attached to the leftover kind of cornea or the adherent cornea that's there. So I'm going to finish up with different laser tissue interactions. So when we talk about different laser variables, we know that we can't change the wavelength of a specified laser, but we can use different lasers that have different wavelengths. In some instances, we can change the spot size. So in photothermal, we can decrease the spot size to 50 microns, that it's very, very tiny, which would be utilized in something like ALT. And then we can increase the spot size for posterior segment procedures. And then obviously we can change either the amount of power, which is what we utilize for milliwatts for photothermal lasers and or the amount of energy in millijoules from a pulse laser like an ND YAG, we can end up changing that on the laser itself. However, different variables affected by tissue can also um, affect when we're talking about the um, interaction that happens. So the transparency of the tissue, again, that can be to the specific wavelength and or it can be the transparency of when we're talking about the cornea itself or if there's a cataract, that can end up affecting also um, how that ends up being transmitted through different media. The amount of pigment that's located uh, within different ocular structures can affect how we end up changing our power associated with our different type of lasers and then also the water content. A type of photothermal reaction is also photovaporization. That photovaporization ends up heating the amount of water both intracellularly and extracellularly and can also create that photothermal damage. Different type of ocular pigments that we think about are going to be hemoglobin, xanthophyll, and melanin. So that hemoglobin is obviously going to be in blood vessels. It can also be in a vitreous hemorrhage. This can be located in your choriocapillaris. I always think about a color wheel of what is going to be absorbed by this. So hemoglobin is going to be red, and with this, it's going to absorb blue and green very well. It's not really going to absorb red at all, um, and this is why if there's a, an indication for um, emergent laser and there ends up being like a vitreous hemorrhage, right, it would end up being a krypton or a red laser as opposed to our photothermal argon laser or our 532 photothermal laser. Xanthophyll is going to be obviously located more so within the macula, within our plexiform layers, and yellow ends up absorbing blue very well. Remember I said in a traditional argon laser, a lot of time we end up filtering out that blue wavelength that increases the wavelength from 488 nanometers up to 514 nanometers, and we filter that out, um, one, to protect the doctors. Again, it's not unusual, kind of yellow filters will pop in automatically on a laser, but also to protect our patients so that we don't end up creating permanent damage within the fovea. And again, longer wavelengths are not going to be absorbed from that green to red. And then finally, melanin. This is going to be where we're talking about that pigment and why this is important. 
that can end up absorbing laser wavelengths across the entire visible spectrum and it um, ends up absorbing infrared so that longer wavelength above 700 nanometers less effectively but the more melanin that you have especially when we're talking about a photothermal laser like an argon laser or a 532 photothermal laser it's going to be better and we're going to need less energy or less power to end up getting our intended tissue change that's there so as you work your way through, I really wanted to provide kind of um, a background as to the different type of lasers and the different type of mechanisms or damage mechanisms associated with each of the popular lasers in ophthalmic surgery to also prepare us to um, finish up the rest of our laser series that happen over the next three weeks, six weeks, and then finish up with Dr. Um, Rich Castillo. I'm going to take questions now, and if you need to email me, my email address is acoyne, A-C-O-Y-N-E, at salus.edu. I'd like to thank Lumenis for hosting this for us and being such great supporters, especially of ASOS. ASOS has really provided uh, a network and kind of a home for people who are interested in laser and minor surgical procedures. Um, I always encourage you to join, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to any of us that end up being um, on the board of ASOS. Perfect. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Coyne. As uh, she mentioned earlier, we will be taking questions right now. Just a reminder, um, there is a question panel in the GoToWebinar um, dashboard. So go ahead and just put in your questions. Um, we'll kick off with a question that came up here. What is a common energy level associated with YAG capsulotomy? And how does it compare to YAG peripheral iridotomy? That's a great question. Um, and our next couple of lectures are definitely going to review that. But if you think about the capsule, right, it's going to be a thinner membrane. So again, you're not going to need as high of an energy level with that. So usually starting about one millijoules is a good spot. Now, that being said, if that is a pretty dense or pretty opacified membrane, there's not going to be as much tension. You might have to increase the millijoules or the energy associated with that to try and get it to start to rip open and really have that traction to open the the especially the posterior capsule. So usually if it's mild, not really affecting the visual acuity a whole lot, you're aiming more towards a lower end of one millijoule. And again, usually a stepwise approach until you end up getting your intended damage. Compare this to when we talk about the iris. So you know that the iris is going to be thicker. Um, you know that you're going to have more pigment that's associated with it. So with that, I usually think a minimum is usually going to be about three millijoules. So we're either double or triple the amount of energy that you would consider for that thin membrane as compared to the posterior capsule. Now, those individuals that are in practice that are doing this, they're sometimes a popular setting is what's called a triple five or a triple six. So the triple part of that ends up being a triple shot and you can change your pulses per burst where you can either have one pulse per burst so you end up firing the laser and you get one pulse or you can do two pulses per burst where you fire the laser once and you end up actually getting two pulses or you get two shots on the laser or finally you end up getting your triple shot or three pulses per burst so you fire the laser once and you end up getting three shots it will be counted as three different energy as your laser ends up counting the total amount of energy that is in the eye. But when we talk about a triple five or a triple six, that would end up being five millijoules and you have a triple shot and or six millijoules and you end up doing a triple burst or a triple or three pulses per burst. So again, you can see that you're going to need more energy to really break through and kind of create that hole in the iris as compared to um, stretching out and really putting more tension to rip open that posterior capsule. Noted, so we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, how popular has laser floater ablation have been among ODs who have laser privileges from Larry Bache? I'm so sorry if I butchered. Hi, Larry. To be honest with you, I'm in Pennsylvania and we don't have laser privileges. I don't have a certain percentage off the top of my head. I can ask some of my colleagues um, in Oklahoma and Kentucky if anybody is actually on here, if they want to also um, put that in to kind of give their feedback on it. 
most times the information that I receive is that it's much more popular to treat more of anterior vitreous floaters, especially if um, they're coming in for a YAG capsulotomy and you push back and you can see a couple of those protein strands. The one thing that you have to consider with um, when we talk about vitreolysis is that you're putting more energy inside the eye and you're a little bit closer to the retina. So there can be uh, retinal side effects that can end up occurring because of it. The other thing that happens is especially if it ends up being a large Weiss's ring, that's, it can take a while to really break them up. Um, and some doctors will say, oh, we just take a big floater and turn it into smaller floaters. But theoretically, if you are connecting or treating um, the, the strands or that Weiss's ring, you're really, again, kind of blasting that apart that it's not necessarily into smaller pieces. If the smaller pieces do occur, it could just be where you're placing those laser spots. But to your original question, I'm sorry, I don't have an appropriate answer as to how popular that it's become. I know that there are certain laser companies that are working on um, improving the depth of focus associated with that in order to promote um, an easier um, an easier procedure of that vitreolysis. Noted. So next question that came in, or uh, actually sure. a feedback that came in. I have a vitreolysis laser. It works well for a wise ring not for a large diffuser floater from Robert Woolridge OD. So Thank just you. To kind, of, just kind of want to bring that in. So the question that came in, how do you explain what the laser procedures are going to do to a patient? You spoke to us a lot about dealing uh, damage. And while that's exactly what we're doing, I assume that it's not the vocabulary used with patients. You're exactly right. Um, so when I talk about it from a peripheral iridotomy standpoint, any time that I think that the patient, and I'm going to say, may experience pain, I never utilize that terminology pain ever with the patient. I will say, you'll be aware. So I use that same terminology also from a posterior segment aspect of when they're going for barrier laser, when they're going for PRP, kind of talking to them, setting them up and say, you'll be in a slit lamp just like this. You'll have a lens on the front surface of the eye different things that you'll expect, especially if it's a PI, I'll talk about, you'll probably hear some popping in your ears. It doesn't take very long, but you might feel it. You might be aware that it's there. Um, when I talk about PRP, again, I use the term aware a lot. Uh, and that is because people have a different pain perception um, as far as that feedback. And I don't wanna scare the patient that they're not gonna end up going for the procedure period. So I like that, that word a lot. I think it covers a lot of ground. Uh, when talking about a YAG capsulotomy procedure, um, I don't really talk about anything about awareness or pain because, again, your posterior capsule isn't going to have those sensory nerves, so they're not going to feel it. They may notice that their vision, even with the contact lens on the front surface, starts to clear up, but I kind of give them a little bit of a better idea that it's only going to take a couple usually I say a couple minutes. Again, it depends on, especially if you're in a teaching institution, if it ends up that you're guiding the student through it, or this ends up being a very experienced optometrist or a very experienced ophthalmologist, as far as how long that that can take. And it can also um, depend on the severity of the opacification, because if it's opacified, almost as though it's like cardboard, it's gonna take longer. They might have to do a different pattern as compared to if it's a 2025 or 2030 PCO. But again, a lot of times when I'm talking to them about it, I don't really ever use the term pain at all. In fact, I avoid it. Um, I will use awareness. I will prep them for that. Um, they might have awareness. They might hear popping in their ears if it's an ND YAG laser. And if it's a photothermal laser, um, even from our retinal specialists, it's not unusual that they'll recommend having the patient take an NSAID even before the procedure. And I will talk to them afterwards that they might notice bright lights that are being flashed in their eyes, that they might have a headache afterwards. And again, we recommend that they do not return to work that day, depending on what time their treatment is at. Now the next question that came in from Stephen um, Wettick. When do you perform double, triple bursts versus single bursts? Why perform one over the other? 
That's a great question. So with this, a lot of times or the most popular times that you're going to perform a double um, burst or a triple burst is going to be for peripheral iridotomy. And the reason for that is that you're going to get two or three consecutive shots, one right after the other. So it kind of helps to chip away a little bit more easily or a little bit more quickly um, through that iris tissue. The reason that you would not want to use a double or triple shot for a peripheral, I'm sorry, for a posterior capsulotomy is because where your first explosion goes off can affect where your second and third also end up exploding. It's still going to be within that cone beam that I showed you, but it may not be at the exact location of where you're focused. So what you don't want to do is we don't want to pit the lens. So that is why we only use a single shot or a single burst um, when we talk about a posterior capsulotomy. But when you talk about a peripheral iridotomy, it's not unusual that you do a double or triple shot. Again, it helps to get deeper a little bit more quickly, um, and it helps uh, be more efficient in the procedure itself. There are some instances where a triple five or a triple six, you might already break through and you get that pigment plume where you get the rush of aqueous from your posterior chamber into your anterior chamber, even with just that the three shots or the two shots, depending on what setting that you end up using. Um, you don't have to utilize that, but it's it's more popular, especially if you think about kind of like chipping away a little bit at the iris. Perfect. So um, with that, I believe we covered the majority of the questions. Um, just a quick feedback left by Hannah Shinoda for you. I uh, just wanted to thank Dr. Coyne for a wonderful and engaging presentation. Her, her expertise on the topic truly shines through. So um, we're thank getting you, a lot Hannah. of thank yous. So with that in mind, um, thank you everyone. Um, we appreciate you being here. Dr. Coyne, thank you so much for the wonderful um, presentation. Um, if you guys have any other questions, you guys have Dr. Coyne's email address um, in the uh, screen. Feel free to reach out. Uh, you could also reach out to Luminous Vision at luminous.vision at luminous.com. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time to the next um, webinar series. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great night. Good night, everyone.